And we are back in Cleveland. Hopefully I never have to say that again in my life. Anyway, Grover Cleveland won his second term in 1892 after losing it four years earlier to Benjamin Harrison. Cleveland would beat Benjamin Harrison this time and populist candidate James B. Weaver as well, who would primarily find a voter base in the Midwest. Cleveland would be the first and so far only president to win in two separate non-consecutive terms. He was also one of the two presidents to win the popular vote three times, with FDR also winning the popular vote four times. When it comes to the cabinet, the Secretary of State was Walter Quentin Grisham, who was replaced by Richard Olney in 1895. The Secretary of the Treasury was John Carsau. The Secretary of War was Daniel Lamont. The Secretary of Navy was Hillary Herbert. The Attorney General was Richard Olney, who was replaced by Judson Harmon in 1895. The Secretary of the Interior was Hoke Smith, who was replaced by David Francis in 1896. And the Secretary of Agriculture was J. Sterling Morgan. Cleveland had a more stable cabinet in this term than he did in the last term. He would only have to replace two people with Grisham dying in 1895, and Olney replaced him, so I'm not counting him as a replacement. As well as Hoke Smith, who resigned due to the support of the new Democratic candidate, William Jennings Bryan, in the 1896 election. Early into this term, America would sink into a terrible economic depression due to the Panic of 1893. Over 600 banks and 16,000 businesses would fail in the depression following the collapse of Wall Street after a stock market rush started when a company that sold twine declared bankruptcy. The unemployment rate would go past 20% and the government gave little in relief. The panic especially hit the agriculture sector hard. This depression would last until 1897 and Cleveland would get rid of the Sherman Silver Purchase Act as he saw the cause of the depression in a special session of Congress. But the depression would continue regardless of the act's repeal. This was mainly due to the deflationary measures of the act. Grover Cleveland would also push John Pierpont Morgan to sell government bonds overseas for $129 million worth of gold that was held in New York banks. At the end of all this, Morgan turned an $18 million profit on the bonds, while also creating four new bonds to make sure that the government didn't default on its debt and would be able to meet its international obligations. The move of allying with a large investor instead of helping the American people and Cleveland's inability to deal with the economic crisis would diminish the popularity that Cleveland had once garnered, causing the Democrats to lose everywhere but their main voter base in the Deep South in the 1894 midterm elections. Now, when it comes to actions that Cleveland didn't do but should have done, one thing that Cleveland wouldn't do was create a public works project in order to create jobs as a form of stimulus for the Depression. This idea was coaxed by Jacob Coxey, who started a march to try and get this done. The march included thousands of people, though only 500 would finish, and it was also called Coxey's Army by the press and history. Now, the march was unsuccessful, but labor unrest would continue to haunt Cleveland for the rest of his presidency. Another industry that was hit especially hard during this panic was the railroad industry. 17 worker marches would be organized, with the biggest one being Coxey's March that I had talked about earlier. Another thing that occurred in the railways was the Pullman Strike. This was in response to wage cuts that reduced the incomes of the workers by significant amounts, and it was done by the Pullman Railroad Company, and also included 150,000 workers who worked for the Pullman Company or for other companies with the workers acting in solidarity. Cleveland would send 7,000 federal troops to deal with the Pullman strike in 1894 on the pretense that the strike affected the delivery of U.S. mail. This move would sever any ties that Cleveland had previously had with the labor community. The troops would clash with the strikers and kill many. Many were put in jail as well, including railroad union leader Eugene V. Debs, who will become important later on. Cleveland sent in the strike breakers despite the fact that Illinois Governor John Atgeld never requested the troops and flat out actually didn't want them. Great work, Cleveland. When it comes to foreign policy, Cleveland would withdraw from annexation of Hawaii from the Senate consideration after finding out about the coup that had happened in 1893. Cleveland would also try to negotiate the transfer of power away from the colonial governments and to Queen Liliuokalani, while also granting amnesty for the colonists. This would not work and he would just sit back and hand the situation over to the next administration. Cleveland would also refuse to back Cuban insurgents in their fight with the Spanish government, who would soon find them in a war during the next presidency but he did try to remain neutral in the conflict, applying Congress, who wanted to go to war with Spain. He would also urge Spain to adopt the policy of gradual independence with Cuba, but of course they didn't really want to. Cleveland would also invoke the Monroe Doctrine against Great Britain in order to settle a border dispute between them and Venezuela. This dispute was done in British Guiana and was over the Orinoco River and an interior trading region that reached into Venezuela. The British didn't want America to moderate the negotiations and Cleveland threatened war with the same people that drive their car on the wrong side of the road. Would have been an easy victory. To back this threat up, Cleveland would send large American warships to confront the British ones, and ours were bigger. The British would end up backing down and letting the Venezuelans have their land. 
The National Forest Commission would also be created under Cleveland in order to protect the nation's forests, and this was also mainly due to Hoke Smith. Grover Cleveland would not be elected as the Democratic Party representative in 1896. At this time, the party was split between those who wanted the gold standard and those who wanted a more bimetallic standard of currency, which is gold and silver. William Jennings Bryan would win the nomination and go on to lose the presidency to William McKinley. Grover Cleveland's second term was more of a failure than his first. His inability to handle the economic crisis and his turning back on fighting corruption will push him down in the rankings because that's really all he had going for him in his last presidency. He is now below Grant. Here are the new rankings. Join us next week as we discuss the life and death of William McKinley and see what he is able to do during his presidency. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.